Part One, Chapter One, Mister Sherlock Holmes. In the year eighteen seventy-eight, I took my degree of Doctor of Medicine of the University of London, and proceeded to Netley to go through the course prescribed for surgeons in the army. Having completed my studies there, I was duly attached to the Fifth Northumberland Fusiliers as assistant surgeon. The regiment was stationed in India at the time, and before I could join it, the Second Afghan War had broken out. On landing at Bombay, I learned that my corps had advanced through the passes and was already deep in the enemy's country. I followed, however, with many other officers who were in the same situation as myself, and succeeded in reaching Kandahar in safety, where I found my regiment and at once entered upon my new duties. The campaign brought honours and promotion to many, but for me it had nothing but misfortune and disaster. I was removed from my brigade and attached to the Berkshires, with whom I served at the fatal battle of Maiwand. There I was struck on the shoulder by a Jezail bullet which shattered the bone and grazed the subclavian artery. I should have fallen into the hands of the murderous Ghazis had it not been for the devotion and courage shown by Murray, my orderly, who threw me across a pack-horse and succeeded in bringing me safely to the British lines. Worn with pain, and weak from the prolonged hardships which I had undergone, I was removed with a great train of wounded sufferers to the base hospital at Peshawar. Here I rallied and had already improved so far as to be able to walk about the wards and even to bask a little upon the veranda when i was struck down by enteric fever that curse of our indian possessions for months my life was despaired of and when at last i came to myself and became convalescent i was so weak and emaciated that a medical board determined that not a day should be lost in sending me back to england I was dispatched, accordingly, in the troopship Orontes, and landed a month later on Portsmouth Jetty, with my health irretrievably ruined, but with permission from a paternal government to spend the next nine months in attempting to improve it. I had neither kith nor kin in England, and was therefore as free as air, or as free as an income of eleven shillings and sixpence a day will permit a man to be. Under such circumstances, I naturally gravitated to London, that great cesspool into which all the loungers and idlers of the empire are irresistibly drained. There I stayed for some time at a private hotel in the Strand, leading a comfortless, meaningless existence, and spending such money as I had, considerably more freely than I ought. So alarmingly did the state of my finances become that i soon realized that i must either leave the metropolis and rusticate somewhere in the country or that i must make a complete alteration in my style of living choosing the latter alternative i began by making up my mind to leave the hotel and to take up my quarters in some less pretentious and less expensive domicile on the very day that i had come to this conclusion i was standing at the criterion bar when someone tapped me on the shoulder and turning around i recognized young stamford who had been a dresser under me at bart's the sight of a friendly face in the great wilderness of london is a pleasant thing indeed to a lonely man in old days stamford had never been a particular crony of mine but now i hailed him with enthusiasm and he in his turn appeared to be delighted to see me in the exuberance of my joy I asked him to lunch with me at the Hoborn, and we started off together in a hansom. "'Whatever have you been doing with yourself, Watson?' he asked in an undisguised wonder, as we rattled through the crowded London streets. "'You are as thin as a lathe, and as brown as a nut.' I gave him a short sketch of my adventures, and had hardly concluded it by the time that we reached our destination. "'Poor devil!' he said commiseratingly after he had listened to my misfortunes <laughs> what are you up to now looking for lodgings i answered trying to solve the problem as to whether it is possible to get comfortable rooms at a reasonable price 
that's a strange thing remarked my companion you are the second man to-day that has used that expression to me and who was the first i asked a fellow who was working at the chemical laboratory up at the hospital he was bemoaning himself this morning because he could not get someone to go halves with him in some nice rooms which he'd found and which were too much for his purse by jove i cried if he really wants someone to share the rooms and the expense i'm the very man for him i should prefer having a partner to being alone young stanford looked rather strangely at me over his wine glass you don't know sherlock holmes yet he said perhaps you would not care for him as a constant companion why what is there against him but oh, i didn't say there was anything against him he's a little queer in his ideas an enthusiast in some branches of science as far as i know he's a decent fellow enough a medical student i suppose said i no i have no idea what he intends to go in for i believe he is well up in anatomy and he is a first-class chemist but as far as i know he's never taken out any systematic medical classes his studies are very desultory and eccentric but he has amassed a lot of out-of-the-way knowledge which would astonish his professors did you never ask him what he was going in for i asked no he is not a man that it is easy to draw out though he can be communicative enough when the fancy seizes him i should like to meet him i said if i am to lodge with anyone i should prefer a man of studious and quiet habits i am not strong enough yet to stand much noise or excitement i had enough of both in afghanistan to last me for the remainder of my natural existence how can i meet this friend of yours he is sure to be at the laboratory returned my companion he either avoids the place for weeks or else he works there from morning to night if you like we shall drive round together after luncheon certainly i answered and the conversation drifted away into other channels as we made our way to the hospital after leaving the holborn stamford gave me a few more particulars about the gentleman whom i proposed to take as a fellow lodger you mustn't blame me if you don't get on with him he said i know nothing more of him than i have learned from meeting him occasionally in the laboratory you propose this arrangement so you must not hold me responsible if we don't get on it will be easy to part company i answered it seems to me stamford i added looking hard at my companion that you have some reason for washing your hands of the matter is this fellow's temper so formidable or what is it don't be mealy-mouthed about it uh, it's not easy to express the inexpressible he answered with a laugh holmes is a little too scientific for my tastes it approaches to cold-bloodedness i could imagine his giving a friend a little pinch of the latest vegetable alkaloid not out of malevolence you understand but simply out of a spirit of inquiry in order to have an accurate idea of the effects to do him justice i think that he would take it himself with the same readiness he appears to have a passion for definite and exact knowledge very right too yes but it may be pushed to excess when it comes to beating the subjects in the dissecting rooms with a stick it is certainly taking rather a bizarre shape beating the subjects yes to verify how far bruises may be produced after death i saw him at it with my own eyes and yet you say he's not a medical student no heaven knows what the objects of his studies are but here we are and you must form your own impressions about him as he spoke we turned down a narrow lane and passed through a small side door which opened into a wing of the great hospital it was familiar ground to me and i needed no guiding as we ascended the bleak stone staircase 
and made our way down the long corridor with its vista of whitewashed wall and dun-coloured doors near the further end a low arched passage branched away from it and led to the chemical laboratory this was a lofty chamber lined and littered with countless bottles broad low tables were scattered about which bristled with retorts test tubes and little bunsen lamps with their blue flickering flames there was only one student in the room who was bending over a distant table absorbed in his work at the sound of our steps he glanced around and sprang to his feet with a cry of pleasure i found it i have found it he shouted to my companion running towards us with a test tube in his hand i have found a reagent which is precipitated by haemoglobin and by nothing else had he discovered a gold mine greater delight could not have shone upon his features dr watson mr sherlock holmes said stamford introducing us how are you he said cordially gripping my hand with a strength for which i should hardly have given him credit you have been in afghanistan i perceive how on earth did you know that i asked in astonishment never mind said he chuckling to himself <laughs> the question now is about haemoglobin no doubt you see the significance of this discovery of mine it is interesting chemically no doubt i answered but practically why man it is the most practical medico-legal discovery for years don't you see that it gives us an infallible test for blood stains come over here now he seized me by the coat sleeve in his eagerness and drew me over to the table at which he had been working let us have some fresh blood he said digging a long bodkin into his finger and drawing off the resulting drop of blood in a chemical pipette now i add this small quantity of blood to a litre of water you perceive that the resulting mixture has the appearance of pure water the proportion of blood cannot be more than one in a million i have no doubt however that we shall be able to obtain the characteristic reaction as he spoke he threw into the vessel a few white crystals and then added some drops of a transparent fluid in an instant the contents assumed a dull mahogany color and a brownish dust was precipitated to the bottom of the glass jar ha ha he cried clapping his hands and looking as delighted as a child with a new toy what do you think of that it seems to be a very delicate test i remarked beautiful beautiful the old guiacum test was very clumsy and uncertain so is the microscopic examination for blood corpuscles the latter is valueless if the stains are a few hours old now this appears to act as well whether the blood is old or new had this test been invented there are hundreds of men now walking the earth who would long ago have paid the penalty of their crimes indeed i murmured criminal cases are continually hinging upon that one point a man is suspected of a crime months perhaps after it has been committed his linen or clothes are examined and brownish stains discovered upon them are they blood stains or mud stains or rust stains or fruit stains or what are they that is a question which has puzzled many an expert and why because there was no reliable test now we have the sherlock holmes test and there will no longer be any difficulty his eyes fairly glittered as he spoke and he put his hand over his heart and bowed as if to some applauding crowd conjured up by his imagination you are to be congratulated i remarked considerably surprised at his enthusiasm there was the case of von bischoff at frankfurt last year he would certainly have been hung had this test been in existence then there was the mason of bradford and the notorious buller and the lefevre of montpellier and samson of new orleans i could name a score of cases in which it would have been decisive you seem to be a walking calendar of crime said stamford with a laugh you might start a paper on those lines call it the police news of the past very interesting reading it might make too remarked sherlock holmes sticking a small piece of plaster over the prick on his finger 
i have to be careful he continued turning to me with a smile for i dabble with poisons a good deal he held out his hand as he spoke and i noticed that it was all mottled over with similar pieces of plaster and discoloured with strong acids we came here on business said stanford sitting down on a high three-legged stool and pushing another one in my direction with his foot my friend here wants to take diggings and as you were complaining that you could get no one to go halves with you i thought i had better bring you together sherlock holmes seemed delighted at the idea of sharing his rooms with me i have my eye on a suite in baker street he said which would suit us down to the ground you don't mind the smell of strong tobacco i hope i always smoke ships myself i answered that's good enough i generally have chemicals about and occasionally do experiments would that annoy you by no means let me see what are my other shortcomings i get in the dumps at times and don't open my mouth for days on end you must not think i'm sulky when i do that just let me alone and i'll soon be right what have you to confess now it's just as well for two fellows to know the worst of one another before they begin to live together i laughed at this cross-examination i keep a bull-pup i said and i object to rows because my nerves are shaken and i get up at all sorts of ungodly hours and i'm extremely lazy i have another set of vices when i'm well but those are the principal ones at present do you include violin playing in your category of rows he asked anxiously it depends on the player i answered a well-played violin is a treat for the gods a badly played one oh that's all right he cried with a merry laugh i think we may consider the thing as settled that is if the rooms are agreeable to you when shall we see them call for me here at noon tomorrow men will go together and settle everything he answered all right noon exactly said i shaking his hand we left him working among his chemicals and we walked together towards my hotel by the way i asked suddenly stopping and turning upon stamford how the deuce did he know that i had come from afghanistan my companion smiled an enigmatical smile that's just his little peculiarity he said a good many people have wanted to know how he finds things out oh a mystery is it i cried rubbing my hands this is very piquant i am much obliged to you for bringing us together the proper study of mankind is man you know you must study him then stamford said as he bade me good-bye you'll find him a knotty problem though i'll wager he learns more about you than you about him good-bye good-bye i answered and strolled on to my hotel considerably interested in my new acquaintance chapter two the science of deduction we met next day as he had arranged and inspected the rooms at number 221 b baker street of which he had spoken at our meeting they consisted of a couple of comfortable bedrooms and a single large airy sitting room cheerfully furnished and illuminated by two broad windows so desirable in every way were the apartments and so moderate did the term seem when divided between us that the bargain was concluded upon the spot and we at once entered into possession that very evening i moved my things round from the hotel and on the following morning sherlock holmes followed me with several boxes and portmanteau for a day or two we were busily employed in unpacking and laying out our property to the best advantage that done we gradually began to settle down and to accommodate ourselves to our new surroundings holmes was certainly not a difficult man to live with he was quiet in his ways and his habits were regular it was rare for him to be up after ten at night and he had invariably breakfasted and gone out before i rose in the morning sometimes he spent his day at the chemical laboratory sometimes in the dissecting rooms and occasionally in long walks which appeared to take him into the lowest portions of the city nothing could exceed his energy when the working fit was upon him but now and again a reaction would seize him and for days on end 
he would lie upon the sofa in the sitting-room hardly uttering a word or moving a muscle from morning to night on these occasions i have noticed such a dreamy vacant expression in his eyes that i might have suspected him of being addicted to the use of some narcotic had not the temperance and cleanliness of his whole life forbidden such a notion as the weeks went by my interest in him and my curiosity as to his aims in life gradually deepened and increased his very person and appearance were such as to strike the attention of the most casual observer in height he was rather over six foot and so excessively lean that he seemed to be considerably taller his eyes were sharp and piercing save during those intervals of torpor to which i have alluded and his thin hawk-like nose gave his whole expression an air of alertness and decision his chin too had the prominence and squareness which mark the man of determination his hands were invariably blotted with ink and stained with chemicals yet he was possessed of extraordinary delicacy of touch as i frequently had occasion to observe when i watched him manipulating his fragile philosophical instruments the reader may set me down as a hopeless busybody when i confess how much this man stimulated my curiosity and how often i endeavoured to break through the reticence which he showed on all that concerned himself before pronouncing judgment however be it remembered how objectless was my life and how little there was to engage my attention my health forbade me from venturing out unless the weather was exceptionally genial and i had no friends who would call upon me and break the monotony of my daily existence under these circumstances i eagerly hailed the little mystery which hung around my companion and spent much of my time in endeavouring to unravel it he was not studying medicine he had himself in reply to a question confirmed stamford's opinion upon that point neither did he appear to have pursued any course of reading which might fit him for a degree in science or any other recognized portal which would give him an entrance into the learned world yet his zeal for certain studies was remarkable and within eccentric limits his knowledge was so extraordinarily ample and minute that his observations have fairly astounded me surely no man would work so hard or attain such precise information unless he had some definite end in view desultory readers are seldom remarkable for the exactness of their learning no man burdens his mind with small matters unless he has some very good reason for doing so his ignorance was as remarkable as his knowledge of contemporary literature philosophy and politics he appeared to know next to nothing upon my quoting thomas carlyle he inquired in the naivest way who he might be and what he had done my surprise reached a climax however when i found incidentally that he was ignorant of the copernican theory and of the composition of the solar system that any civilized human being in his nineteenth century should not be aware that the earth traveled around the sun appeared to be to me such an extraordinary fact that i could hardly realize it you appear to be astonished he said smiling at my expression of surprise now that i do know it i shall do my best to forget it to forget it you see he explained i consider that a man's brain originally is like a little empty attic and you have to stock it with such furniture as you choose a fool takes in all the lumber of every sort that he comes across so that the knowledge which might be useful to him gets crowded out or at best is jumbled up with a lot of other things so that he has a difficulty in laying his hands upon it now the skilful workman is very careful indeed as to what he takes into his brain attic he will have nothing but the tools which may help him in doing his work but of these he has a large assortment and all in the most perfect order it is a mistake to think that the little room has elastic walls and can distend to any extent depend upon it there comes a time when for every addition of knowledge you forget something that you knew before it is of the highest importance therefore 
not to have useless facts elbowing out the useful ones but the solar system i protested what the deuce is it to me he interrupted impatiently you say that we go round the sun if we went round the moon it would not make a pennyworth of difference to me or to my work i was on the point of asking him what that work might be but something in his manner showed me that the question would be an unwelcome one i pondered over our short conversation however and endeavoured to draw my deductions from it he said that he would acquire no knowledge which did not bear upon his object therefore all the knowledge which he possessed was such as would be useful to him i enumerated in my own mind all the various points upon which he had shown me that he was exceptionally well informed i even took a pencil and jotted them down i could not help smiling at the document when i had completed it it ran in this way sherlock holmes his limits one knowledge of literature nil two philosophy nil three astronomy nil four politics feeble five botany variable well up in belladonna opium and poisons generally knows nothing of practical gardening six geology practical but limited tells at a glance different soils from each other after he walks shown me splashes upon his trousers and told me by their colour and consistence in what part of london he had received them seven chemistry profound eight anatomy accurate but unsystematic nine sensational literature immense he appears to know every detail of every horror perpetrated in the century ten plays the violin well eleven is an expert single-stick player boxer and swordsman twelve has a good practical knowledge of british law when i got so far in my list i threw it into the fire in despair if i can only find out what the fellow is driving at by reconciling all these accomplishments and discovering a calling which needs them all i said to myself i may as well give up the attempt at once i see that i have alluded above to his powers upon the violin these were very remarkable but as eccentric as all his other accomplishments that he could play pieces and difficult pieces i knew well because at my request he has played me some of mendelssohn's leader and other favorites when left to himself however he would seldom produce any music or attempt any recognized air leaning back in his armchair of an evening he would close his eyes and scrape carelessly at the fiddle which was thrown across his knee sometimes the chords were sonorous and melancholy occasionally they were fantastic and cheerful clearly they reflected the thoughts which possessed him but whether the music aided those thoughts or whether the playing was simply the result of a whim or fancy was more than i could determine i might have rebelled against these exasperating solos had it not been that he usually terminated them by playing in quick succession a whole series of my favorite airs as a slight compensation for the trial upon my patience during the first week or so we had no callers and i had begun to think that my companion was as friendless a man as i was myself presently however i found that he had many acquaintances and those in the most different classes of society there was one little sallow rat-faced dark-eyed fellow who was introduced to me as mr lestrade and who came three or four times in a single week one morning a young girl called fashionably dressed and stayed for half an hour or more the same afternoon brought a grey-headed seedy visitor looking like a jew peddler who appeared to me to be much excited and who was closely followed by a slipshod elderly woman on another occasion an old white-haired gentleman had an interview with my companion and on another a railway porter in his velveteen uniform 
when any of these nondescript individuals put in an appearance sherlock holmes used to beg for the use of the sitting-room and i would retire to my bedroom he always apologized to me for putting me to this inconvenience i have to use this room as a place of business he said and these people are my clients again i had an opportunity of asking him a point-blank question and again my delicacy prevented me from forcing another man to confide in me i imagined at the time that he had some strong reason for not alluding to it but he soon dispelled the idea by coming round to the subject of his own accord it was upon the fourth of march as i have good reason to remember that i rose somewhat earlier than usual and found that sherlock holmes had not yet finished his breakfast the landlady had become so accustomed to my late habits that my place had not been laid nor my coffee prepared with the unreasonable petulance of mankind i rang the bell and gave a curt intimation that i was ready then i picked up a magazine from the table and attempted to while away the time with it while my companion munched silently at his toast one of the articles I had a pencil mark at the heading and i naturally began to run my eye through it its somewhat ambitious title was the book of life and it attempted to show how much an observant man might learn by an accurate and systematic examination of all that came in his way it struck me as being a remarkable mixture of shrewdness and of absurdity the reasoning was close and intense but the deductions appeared to me to be far-fetched and exaggerated the writer claimed by a momentary expression a twitch of a muscle or a glance of an eye to fathom a man's inmost thoughts deceit according to him was an impossibility in the case of one trained to observation and analysis his conclusions were as infallible as so many propositions of euclid so startling would his results appear to the uninitiated that until they learned the processes by which he had arrived at them they might well consider him as a necromancer from a drop of water said the writer a logician could infer the possibility of an atlantic or a niagara without having seen or heard of one or the other so all life is a great chain the nature of which is known whenever we are shown a single link of it like all other arts the science of deduction and analysis is one which can only be acquired by long and patient study nor is life long enough to allow any mortal to attain the highest possible perfection in it before turning to those moral and mental aspects of the matter which present the greatest difficulties let the inquirer begin by mastering more elementary problems let him on meeting a fellow mortal learn at a glance to distinguish the history of the man and the trade or profession to which he belongs puerile as such an exercise may seem it sharpens the faculties of observation and teaches one where to look and what to look for by a man's fingernails by his coat sleeve by his boot by his trouser knees by the callosities of his forefinger and thumb by his expression by his shirt cuffs by each of these things a man's calling is plainly revealed that all united should fail to enlighten the competent inquirer in any case is almost inconceivable what ineffable twaddle i cried slapping the magazine down on the table i never read such rubbish in my life what is it asked sherlock holmes why this article i said pointing at it with my egg spoon as i sat down to my breakfast i see that you've read it since you've marked it i don't deny that it's smartly written it irritates me though it's evidently the theory of some armchair lounger who evolves all these neat little paradoxes in the seclusion of his own study it is not practical i should like to see him clapped down in a third-class carriage on the underground and asked to give the trades of all his fellow travellers i would lay a thousand to one against him you would lose your money sherlock holmes remarked calmly as for the article i wrote it myself you yes i have a turn both for observation and for deduction 
the theories which i have expressed there and which appear to you to be so chimerical are really extremely practical so practical that i depend upon them for my bread and cheese and how i asked involuntarily well i have a trade of my own i suppose i am the only one in the world i am a consulting detective if you can understand what that is here in london we have lots of government detectives and lots of private ones when these fellows are at fault they come to me and i manage to put them on the right scent they lay all the evidence before me and i am generally able by the help of my knowledge of the history of crime to set them straight there is a strong family resemblance about misdeeds and if you have all the details of a thousand at your finger ends it is odd if you can't unravel the thousand and first lestrade is a well-known detective he got himself into a fog recently over a forgery case and that was what brought him here and these other people they are mostly sent on by private inquiry agencies they are all people who are in trouble about something and want a little enlightening i listen to their story they listen to my comments and then i pocket my fee but do you mean to say i said that without leaving your room you can unravel some knot which other men can make nothing of although they have seen every detail for themselves quite so i have a kind of intuition that way now and again a case turns up which is a little more complex then i have to bustle about and see things with my own eyes you see i have a lot of special knowledge which i apply to the problem and which facilitates matters wonderfully those rules of deduction laid down in that article which roused your scorn are invaluable to me in practical work observation with me is second nature you appeared to be surprised when i told you on our first meeting that you had come from afghanistan you were told no doubt nothing of the sort i knew you came from afghanistan from long habit the train of thoughts ran so swiftly through my mind that i arrived at the conclusion without being conscious of intermediate steps there were such steps however the train of reasoning ran here is a gentleman of a medical type but with the air of a military man clearly an army doctor then he has just come from the tropics for his face is dark and that is not the natural tint of his skin for his wrists are fair he has undergone hardships and sickness as his haggard face says clearly his left arm has been injured he holds it in a stiff and unnatural manner where in the tropics could an english army doctor have seen much hardship and got his arm wounded clearly in afghanistan the whole train of thought did not occupy a second i then remarked that you came from afghanistan and you were astonished it's simple enough as you explain it i said smiling you remind me of edgar allan poe's dupin i had no idea that such individuals did exist outside of stories sherlock holmes rose and lit his pipe no doubt you think that you are complimenting me and comparing me to dupin he observed now in my opinion dupin was a very inferior fellow that trick of his of breaking in on his friend's thoughts with an apropos remark after a quarter of an hour's silence is really very showy and superficial he had some analytical genius no doubt but he was by no means such a phenomenon as poe appeared to imagine have you read gaboriau's works i asked does lecoq come up to your idea of a detective sherlock holmes sniffed sardonically <laughs> lecoq was a miserable bungler he said in an angry voice he had only one thing to recommend him and that was his energy that book made me positively ill the question was how to identify an unknown prisoner i could have done it in twenty-four hours lecoq took six months or so might be made a textbook for detectives to teach them what to avoid i felt rather indignant at having two characters whom i had admired treated in this cavalier style i walked over to the window and stood looking out into the busy street this fellow may be very clever i said to myself but he's certainly very conceited there are no crimes and no criminals in these days he said querulously what is the use of having brains in our profession i know well that i have it in me to make my name famous 
no man lives or has ever lived who has brought the same amount of study and of natural talent to the detection of crime which i have done and what is the result there is no crime to detect or at most some bungling villainy with a motive so transparent that even a scotland yard official can see through it i was still annoyed at his bumptious style of conversation i thought it best to change the topic i wonder what that fellow is looking for i asked pointing to a stalwart plainly dressed individual who was walking slowly down the other side of the street looking anxiously at the numbers he had a large blue envelope in his hand and was evidently the bearer of a message you mean the retired sergeant of marines said sherlock holmes brag and bounce i thought to myself he knows that i cannot verify his guess the thought had hardly passed through my mind when the man whom we were watching caught sight of the number on our door and ran rapidly across the roadway we heard a loud knock a deep voice below and a heavy step ascending the stair for mr sherlock holmes he said stepping into the room and handing my friend the letter here was an opportunity of taking the conceit out of him he little thought of this when he made that random shot may i ask my lad i said in the blandest voice what your trade may be commissioner sir he said gruffly uniform away for repairs and you were i asked with a slightly malicious glance at my companion a sergeant sir royal marine light infantry sir no answer right sir he clicked his heels together raised his hand in a salute and was gone chapter three the loriston garden mystery i confess that i was considerably startled by this fresh proof of the practical nature of my companion's theories my respect for his powers of analysis increased wondrously there still remained some lurking suspicion in my mind however that the whole thing was a prearranged episode intended to dazzle me though what earthly object he could have in taking me in was past my comprehension when i looked at him he had finished reading the note and his eyes had assumed the vacant lack-lustre expression which showed mental abstraction how in the world did you deduce that i asked deduce what said he petulantly why that he was a retired sergeant of marines i have no time for trifles he answered brusquely then with a smile excuse my rudeness you broke the thread of my thoughts but perhaps it is as well so you actually were not able to see that the man was a sergeant of marines no indeed it was easier to know it than to explain why i knew it if you were asked to prove that two and two made four you might find some difficulty and yet you are quite sure of the fact even across the street i could see a great blue anchor tattooed on the back of the fellow's hand that smacked of the sea he had a military carriage however and regulation side whiskers there we have the marine he was a man with some amount of self-importance and a certain air of command you must have observed the way in which he held his head and swung his cane a steady respectable middle-aged man too on the face of him all facts which led me to believe that he had been a sergeant wonderful i ejaculated commonplace said holmes though i thought from his expression that he was pleased at my evident surprise and admiration i said just now that there were no criminals it appears that i am wrong look at this he threw me over the note which the commissionaire had brought why i cried as i cast my eye over it this is terrible it does seem to be a little out of the common he remarked calmly would you mind reading it to me aloud this is the letter which i read to him dear mr sherlock holmes there has been a bad business during the night at three loriston gardens off the brixton road our man on the beat saw a light there about two in the morning and as the house was an empty one suspected that something was amiss he found the door open and in the front room which is bare of furniture discovered the body of a gentleman well dressed and having cards in his pocket bearing the name of enoch j drebber cleveland ohio usa 
there had been no robbery nor is there any evidence as to how the man met his death there are marks of blood in the room but there is no wound upon his person we are at a loss as to how he came into the empty house indeed the whole affair is a puzzler if you can come round to the house any time before twelve you will find me there i have left everything in statu quo until i hear from you if you are unable to come i shall give you fuller details and would esteem it a great kindness if you would favour me with your opinion yours faithfully tobias gregson gregson is the smartest of the scotland yarders my friend remarked he and lestrade are the pick of a bad lot they are both quick and energetic but conventional shockingly so they have their knives into one another too they are as jealous as a pair of professional beauties there will be some fun over this case if they are both put upon the scent i was amazed at the calm way in which he rippled on surely there's not a moment to be lost i cried shall i go and order you a cab i'm not sure about whether i shall go i am the most incurably lazy devil that ever stood in shoe leather that is when the fit is on me for i can be spry enough at times why it is just such a chance as you've been longing for my dear fellow what does it matter to me supposing i unravel the whole matter you may be sure that gregson lestrade and co will pocket all the credit that comes of being an unofficial personage but he begs you to help him yes he knows that i am his superior and acknowledges it to me but he would cut his tongue out before he would own it to any third person however we may as well go and have a look i shall work it out on my own hook i may have a laugh at them if i have nothing else come on he hustled on his overcoat and bustled about in a way that showed that an energetic fit had superseded the apathetic one get your hat he said you wish me to come yes if you have nothing better to do a minute later we were both in a hansom driving furiously for the brixton road it was a foggy cloudy morning and a dun-coloured veil hung over the housetops looking like the reflection of the mud-coloured streets beneath my companion was in the best of spirits and prattled away about cremona fiddles and the difference between a stradivarius and an amati as for myself i was silent for the dull weather and the melancholy business upon which we were engaged depressed my spirits you don't seem to give much thought to the matter in hand i said at last interrupting holmes musical disquisition no data yet he answered it is a capital mistake to theorize before you have all the evidence it biases the judgment you will have your data soon i remarked pointing with my finger this is the brixton road and that is the house if i'm not very much mistaken so it is stop driver stop we were still a hundred yards or so from it but he insisted upon our alighting and we finished our journey upon foot number three loriston gardens wore an ill-omened and minatory look it was one of four which stood back some little way from the street two being occupied and two empty the latter looked out with three tiers of vacant melancholy windows which were blank and dreary save that here and there a toulette card had developed like a cataract upon the bleared panes a small garden sprinkled over with a scattered eruption of sickly plants separated each of these houses from the street and was traversed by a narrow pathway yellowish in color and consisting apparently of a mixture of clay and of gravel the whole place was very sloppy from the rain which had fallen through the night the garden was bounded by a three-foot brick wall with a fringe of wood rails upon the top and against this wall was leaning a stalwart police constable surrounded by a small knot of loafers who craned their necks and strained their eyes in the vain hope of catching some glimpse of the proceedings within i had imagined that sherlock holmes would at once have hurried into the house and plunged into a study of the mystery nothing appeared to be further from his intention with an air of nonchalance which 
under the circumstances seems to me to border upon affectation he lounged up and down the pavement and gazed vacantly at the ground the sky the opposite houses and the line of railings having finished his scrutiny he proceeded slowly down the path or rather down the fringe of grass which flanked the path keeping his eyes riveted upon the ground twice he stopped and once i saw him smile and heard him utter an exclamation of satisfaction there were many marks of footsteps upon the wet clayey soil but since the police had been coming and going over it i was unable to see how my companion could hope to learn anything from it still i had had such extraordinary evidence of the quickness of his perceptive faculties that i had no doubt that he could see a great deal which was hidden from me at the door of the house we were met by a tall white-faced flaxen-haired man with notebook in his hand who rushed forward and wrung my companion's hand with effusion it is indeed kind of you to come he said i've had everything left untouched except that my friend answered pointing at the pathway if a herd of buffaloes had passed along there could not be a greater mess no doubt however you had drawn your own conclusions gregson before you permitted this i've had so much to do inside the house the detective said evasively my colleague mr lestrade is here i had relied upon him to look after this holmes glanced at me and raised his eyebrows sardonically with two such men as yourself and lestrade upon the ground there will not be much for a third party to find out he said gregson rubbed his hands in a self-satisfied way i think we've done all that can be done he answered it's a queer case though and i knew your taste for such things you did not come here in a cab asked sherlock holmes no sir nor lestrade no sir then let us go and look at the room with which inconsequent remark he strode on into the house followed by gregson whose features expressed his astonishment a short passage bare planked and dusty led to the kitchen and offices two doors opened out of it to the left and to the right one of these had obviously been closed for many weeks the other belonged to the dining room which was the apartment in which the mysterious affair had occurred holmes walked in and i followed him with that subdued feeling at my heart which the presence of death inspires it was a large square room looking all the larger from the absence of all furniture a vulgar flaring paper adorned the walls but it was blotched in places with mildew and here and there great strips had become detached and hung down exposing the yellow plaster underneath opposite the door was a showy fireplace surmounted by a mantelpiece of imitation white marble on one corner of this was stuck the stump of a red wax candle the solitary window was so dirty that the light was hazy and uncertain giving a dull gray tinge to everything which was intensified by the thick layer of dust which coated the whole apartment all these details i observed afterwards at present my attention was centred upon the single grim motionless figure which lay stretched upon the boards with vacant sightless eyes staring up at the discoloured ceiling it was that of a man about forty-three or forty-four years of age middle-sized broad-shouldered with crisp curling black hair and a short stubbly beard he was dressed in a heavy broadcloth frock coat and waistcoat with light-coloured trousers and immaculate collar and cuffs a top hat well brushed and trim was placed upon the floor beside him his hands were clenched and his arms thrown abroad while his lower limbs were interlocked as though this death struggle had been a grievous one on his rigid face there stood an expression of horror and as it seemed to me of hatred such as i've never seen upon human features this malignant and terrible contortion combined with the low forehead blunt nose and prognathous jaw gave the dead man a singularly simious and ape-like appearance which was increased by his writhing unnatural posture i've seen death in many forms 
but never has it appeared to me in a more fearsome aspect than in that dark grimy apartment which looked out upon one of the main arteries of suburban london lestrade lean and ferret-like as ever was standing by the doorway and greeted my companion and myself this case will make a stir sir he remarked it beats anything i've seen and i'm no chicken there is no clue said gregson none at all chimed in lestrade sherlock holmes approached the body and kneeling down examined it intently you are sure there is no wound he asked pointing to numerous gouts and splashes of blood which lay all around positive cried both detectives then of course this blood belongs to a second individual presumably the murderer if murder has been committed it reminds me of the circumstances attendant on the death of van jansen in utrecht in the year thirty four do you remember the case gregson no sir uh, read it up you really should there's nothing new under the sun it has all been done before as he spoke his nimble fingers were flying here and there and everywhere feeling pressing unbuttoning examining while his eyes wore the same far-away expression which i've already remarked upon so swiftly was the examination made that one would hardly have guessed the minuteness with which it was conducted finally he sniffed the dead man's lips and then glanced at the soles of his patent leather boots he has not been moved at all he asked no more than was necessary for the purposes of our examination you can take him to the mortuary now he said there's nothing more to be learned gregson had a stretcher and four men at hand at his call they entered the room and the stranger was lifted and carried out as they raised him a ring tinkled down and rolled across the floor lestrade grabbed it up and stared at it with mystified eyes there's been a woman here he cried it's a woman's wedding ring he held it out as he spoke upon the palm of his hand we all gathered round and gazed at it there could be no doubt that the circlet of plain gold had once adorned the finger of a bride this complicates matters said gregson heaven knows they were complicated enough before you're sure it doesn't simplify them observed holmes there's nothing to be learned by staring at it what did you find in his pockets we have it all here said gregson pointing to a litter of objects upon one of the bottom steps of the stairs a gold watch number ninety seven one sixty three by barrow of london gold albert chain very heavy and solid gold ring with masonic device gold pin bulldog's head with rubies as eyes russian leather card case with cards of enoch j drebber of cleveland corresponding with the ejd upon the linen no purse but loose money to the extent of seven pounds thirteen pocket edition of boccaccio's decameron with name of joseph stangerson upon the flyleaf two letters one addressed to e j drebber and one to joseph stangerson at what address american exchange strand to be left till called for they're both from the guion steamship company and refer to the sailing of their boats from liverpool it is clear that this unfortunate man was about to return to new york have you made any inquiries as to this man stangerson i did it at once said gregson i've had the advertisement sent to all the newspapers and one of my men has gone to the american exchange but he hasn't returned yet have you sent to cleveland we telegraphed this morning how did you word your inquiries we simply detailed the circumstances and said that we should be glad of any information which could help us you did not ask for particulars on any point which appeared to you to be crucial i asked about stangerson nothing else is there no circumstance on which this whole case appears to hinge will you not telegraph again i've said all i have to say said gregson in an offended voice sherlock holmes chuckled to himself and appeared to be about to make some remark when 
lestrade who had been in the front room while we were holding this conversation in the hall reappeared upon the scene rubbing his hands in a pompous and self-satisfied manner mr gregson he said i've just made a discovery of the highest importance and one which would have been overlooked had it not been made a careful examination of the walls the little man's eyes sparkled as he spoke and he was evidently in a state of suppressed exultation at having scored a point against his colleague come here he said bustling back into the room the atmosphere of which felt clearer since the removal of its ghastly inmate now stand there he struck a match on his boot and held it up against the wall look at that he said triumphantly i have remarked that the paper had fallen away in parts in this particular corner of the room a large piece had peeled off leaving a yellow square of coarse plastering across this bare space there was scrawled in blood-red letters a single word r a c h e what do you think of that cried the detective with the air of a showman exhibiting his show this was overlooked because it was in the darkest corner of the room and no one thought of looking there the murderer has written it with his or her own blood see this smear where it was trickled down the wall that disposes of the idea of suicide anyway why was that corner chosen to write it on i'll tell you see that candle on the mantelpiece it was lit at the time and if it was lit this corner would be the brightest instead of the darkest portion of the wall and what does it mean now that you have found it asked gregson in a depreciatory voice mean why it means that the writer was going to put the female name rachel but was disturbed before he or she had time to finish you mark my words when this case comes to be cleared up you'll find that a woman named rachel has something to do with it it's all very well for you to laugh mr sherlock holmes you may be very smart and clever but the old hound is the best when all is said and done i really beg your pardon said my companion who had ruffled the little man's temper by bursting into an explosion of laughter you certainly have the credit of being the first of us to find this out and as you say it bears every mark of having been written by the other participant in last night's mystery i have not had time to examine this room yet but with your permission i shall do so now as he spoke he whipped a tape measure and a large round magnifying glass from his pocket with these two implements he trotted noiselessly about the room sometimes stopping occasionally kneeling and once lying flat upon his face so engrossed was he with his occupation that he appeared to have forgotten our presence for he chattered away to himself under his breath the whole time keeping up a running fire of exclamations groans whistles and little cries suggestive of encouragement and of hope as i watched him i was irresistibly reminded of a pure-blooded well-trained foxhound as it dashes backwards and forwards through the covert whining in its eagerness until it comes across the lost scent for twenty minutes or more he continued his researches measuring with the most exact care the distance between marks which were entirely invisible to me and occasionally applying his tape to the walls in an equally incomprehensible manner in one place he gathered up very carefully a little pile of gray dust from the floor and packed it away in an envelope finally he examined with his glass the word upon the wall going over every letter of it with the most minute exactness this done he appeared to be satisfied for he replaced his tape and his glass in his pocket they say that genius is an infinite capacity for taking pains he remarked with a smile it's a very bad definition but it does apply to detective work gregson and lestrade had watched the maneuvers of their amateur companion with considerable curiosity and some contempt they evidently failed to appreciate the fact which i had begun to realize that sherlock holmes smallest actions were all directed towards some definite and practical end what do you think of it sir 
they both asked it would be robbing you of the credit of the case if i was to presume to help you remarked my friend you are doing so well now that it would be a pity for anyone to interfere there was a world of sarcasm in his voice as he spoke if you will let me know how your investigations go he continued i shall be happy to give you any help i can in the meantime i should like to speak to the constable who found the body can you give me his name and address lestrade glanced at his notebook john rance he said he's off duty now you'll find him at forty six audley court kennington park gate holmes took a note of the address come along doctor he said we shall go and look him up i'll tell you one thing which may help you in the case he continued turning to the two detectives there has been murder done and the murderer was a man he was more than six feet high was in the prime of life had small feet for his height wore coarse square-toed boots and smoked a trichinopoly cigar he came here with his victim in a four-wheeled cab which was drawn by a horse with three old shoes and one new one on his off foreleg in all probability the murderer had a florid face and the fingernails of his right hand were remarkably long there are only a few indications but they may assist you lestrade and gregson glanced at each other with an incredulous smile if this man was murdered how was it done asked the former poison said sherlock holmes curtly and strode off one other thing lestrade he added turning around at the door rache is the german for revenge so don't lose your time looking for miss rachel with which parthian shot he walked away leaving the two rivals open-mouthed behind him